this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of May 21st, 2018. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The Michael Duke Show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 9 to 11 a.m. I join Michael on the show each Tuesday morning from 9.15 to 10 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three are these. A look at what drove the increase in state spending this session. Yes, I said increase. Second, the fiscal story the Alaska Senate keeps telling itself in hopes that others buy it. And third, we may already have the best campaign ad this season. And now, let's join Michael. All right, it's about that time. Time to hit it with our friend Brad Keithley from Alaskans for Sustainable Budget. Uh, let's uh, let's get down into it, shall we? Brad Keithley joins us every week to discuss oil, gas, and the economic forecast of Alaska. It's the Michael Dukes Show. Oh, yeah. Every week, Brad Keithley comes in, and he and I get a chance to sit down and talk about usually oil, gas, and politics. Today, it's like politics, oil, and gas, so we'll kind of go backwards on stuff today. But he's got his weekly top three that he likes to always sit down and chat with us about, and we are more than happy to have him on the program. Good morning, Brad. How are you? Michael, I'm doing great. I think you just uh, you just sold me on listening to tomorrow's program with Tammy. Oh, I think so. I was going to see if I could, you know, I thought oh, maybe I should get you guys together on the same program just to see what would happen. Uh, I mean, the thing is, I love Tammy and we're friends and we agree on most everything. But these last couple things, uh, I think that she is kind of. Uh, I, I I don't know if she drank the Kool Aid or maybe she feels like she got more information than we got. I don't know. Well, she's probably if she's listening today, she's probably gonna get a double dose of it because I'm I'm gonna hit three thirty one again today. Well, you know, you you can only sometimes you gotta punch the bad things in the face multiple times. That's what happens, you know, until they're down and then you quit. Then you quit. Um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, you got a couple three things you want to talk about three thirty one. You want to talk about the hypocrisy in the Senate. Where do you want to start? <clears throat> Well, let's talk about uh, let's talk about the last legislative session again, and and some some additional data that's come out about uh, the the amount that the legislature spent uh, and where that's coming from. There's been some posts on uh, on social media, Facebook. Uh, Steve St. Clair, who's very good at following this stuff, has a Facebook page called Alaska Conservatives, uh, posted an analysis that he got from Juno. Uh, that have been done by Ledge Finance, breaking down uh, uh, the operating budget into various categories. And frankly, uh, for those who for those who haven't seen it, you can find it on Steve's uh, Facebook page, Alaska Conservatives. Uh, we also posted a, 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 a posted it on uh, our Facebook page at Alaska for Sustainable Budgets. But it really it does a great job of breaking down the operating budget. Um, in in the sense that it shows uh, the unrestricted general fund uh, spending, the designated general fund spending, other state spending, which is a fairly big category, uh, this legislature, and then federal spending. So it's sort of an all-in uh, look at the operating budget, and reveal and and has a, a column in it that I think uh, is also important. Uh, it's it's a column that is headed bills, and it shows the impact. Uh, of the fiscal impact of the bills that the legislature um, passed this session. So it really allows you to some degree to isolate uh, what the big drivers have been of spending. The point that Steve and others have made from looking at this is that, um, contrary to what some may claim, 
the operating budget has had a, uh, uh, a significant increase uh, over this legislature. It went from, if you look at the numbers before the permanent fund dividend, which the legislature has started inc including as spending now, but if you but it has a a total before that. If you look at total spending, federal, uh, state um, combined, uh, it shows that spending went uh, from the uh, the the previous year, the the uh, fiscal year eighteen, eight point eight nine billion dollars, roughly eight point nine billion dollars, rounded to ten billion dollars, to uh, uh, for fiscal year nineteen, the session just ended ten point two billion dollars. So, an increase of about one point two billion dollars in total spending. Uh, that's a that's a huge increase. It's a right. you know ten percent increase in a in a in a an environment where Legislators have talked about no making no increases at all. Uh, the governor's claimed to you know have been reducing the budget, and now all of a sudden we have a we have a 1.2 billion dollar uh, increase that's showing up. So it's um, it, it that that chart is a is a great way to focus on on what's been going on uh, in the legislature and sort of uh, responding to those who claim that uh, uh, that we this legislature like like others that the claim has been made about has cut spending. This this chart shows that, in fact, spending has not been cut. Right, <clears throat> because even if you take out the dividend, once you take out the dividend factor and you take out HB 331, the 800-plus million dollars for that, I mean, by the time it's all said and done, they're still up three or four hundred million dollars. I mean, in a time when we are still crushing it with a deficit and everything else, um, that there is, there's no excusing this when it's all said and done. You can parse it out into saying, "Well, we cut the increase over here, or we cut the increase over here, or we cut the expenditures from this bucket over here." But what they're failing to acknowledge is that from all buckets, the 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 overall expenditures are up, you know, two, three, four hundred million dollars over last year. That's the bottom line. Well, yeah, and and the bottom line, and you really can isolate using this chart. You really can isolate where that billion two is coming from. It's coming from if you look if you look through the chart, piece through the chart, it's really coming from two things. One is coming from HB three thirty one. It's coming from the oil and gas tax credit bill, and and that shows up uh, under bills under the column that's headed bills, uh, and you look down to what's called statewide items. Um, and you see that there's about $865 million, about two-thirds of the increase uh, is, is in, uh, uh, in these bills, in, this, in these statewide items. And the bulk of that, about 860 of the 865, is coming from HB 331. It comes in, it comes in three parts. One is the special appropriation uh, for about $737 million, which is the bond. Uh, the proceeds from the bonds that the state's going to issue that will come into the state and then be used to pay out money to the uh, to the gas producers. And then the debt service, the $27 million debt service, is the first year's debt service on those bonds. And then the $100 million in fund capitalization is hundred an extra $100 million that the legislature threw in to pay oil and gas tax credits uh, this year. Uh, that's over and above the bonding amount. So right. by the time you add, by the time you add those three things in, of the 1.2 billion dollar uh, increase in overall spending, 837 million of it, or 865 million of it, is coming from uh, is coming from one single act, uh, HB 331. Uh, and you know, I, it, it, Tammy can talk about it. Others can talk about it, but but. When you when people point out that there's been this huge increase, this 1.2 billion dollar increase uh, in spending between FY 2018 and FY 2019, 865 million dollars of it is coming from HB 331. Uh, so it's uh, that's that's one place that the uh, that this increased spending is coming from. And then the other that again, this chart allows you to isolate where the other roughly $400 million is coming from, and that's an increase in spending by health and social services. Uh, FY 2018 is about $2.7 billion. FY 2019 
uh, all in is about $3.2 billion, an increase of about $400 million. Most of that, $400 million, is federal funds, flow-through funds. Right. So HHA, HSS has, has managed to position itself to increase the, the flow of federal funds coming in to the, the department, um, and those are showing up as additional spending numbers, and indeed they are additional spending numbers, but they're not additional state spending numbers. They're additional uh, uh, federal, federal spending right. numbers. So that $1.2 billion, so the $1.2 billion, $400 million of it largely is coming from federal, uh, a, a, an increase in federal funding from HSS, and then the a- other $800 million is coming from HB 331. It, when, when you know, re- People are Republicans, uh, particularly Republicans in the Valley, are very focused on talking about the increased spending. But you have to look at where the increased spending is coming from to understand what the cause of it is. And and this bump, this huge bump that we're that we're seeing this legislature is is coming from the Republicans themselves. Is coming from their vote uh, to accelerate payments beyond what was required in the statute. Uh, to these to the oil and gas producers to issue bonds uh, that will that will kick the can down the road and hit uh, uh, Alaskans in the uh, in the in the 2020s um, and and that's you know that's the cause of this increased spending so some some may try to try to you know blame it on other people try to blame it on uh, uh, the Democrats and and there are there are some spending increases going on there. That are driven by the Democrats. There's an increase, uh, a relatively small increase compared to these numbers uh, in K through 12 funding. There's a relatively small increase in the university uh, uh, funding, but the big bulk of the increased spending is coming from the Republicans themselves. Now, what would you say, Brad, to Republicans um, uh, or others who say, for example, this 400 million dollars, uh, roughly, uh, in health and social services? That is uh, coming from the federal government, uh, and and you know we say we say hey you've increased it, and they say oh hey that's free federal money. What is your what is your argument to that uh, when it comes down to say hey what we didn't increase it? I mean we're just we're just spending money, but the federal government's giving us more. What's your argument there? Well, there's a federal there's a state match to to most of these federal dollars. There's about a hundred million dollars, a little bit over a hundred million dollars in state match required uh, for, in part for the $400 million, in part for other things. Um, and so you have an increase in state spending. Now, that particular component of state spending is being offset by decreases elsewhere. So net-net, uh, we're not increasing state spend to get that $400 million. It is uh, uh, the $100 million in match is being, is being offset elsewhere. But, but it's creating an additional expectation. I mean, long term, it creates an additional expectation of additional services that are being provided by the state. The feds, frankly, are an unreliable source of funding. We have this continual discussion going on in D.C. about capping and cutting Medicaid, uh, 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 federal support to state Medicaid services. Uh, we have, you know, an additional. We have this ongoing discussion in D.C. about finding other ways to cut uh, federal support to to state governments. And so, what we're doing when we accept these funds and when we expand services is we're increasing expectations of Alaskans for for what government can do. And and when the federal government cuts back or or when uh, Obamacare, as an example, Medicaid expansion, for example, uh, kicks in to state the state contribution requirements as it does along in here this year or next. Uh, we we we've created these expectations at the state level, and um, and you know state, and then people look to government, state government, uh, to fill it in because you know as far as they know, state government's been providing it all along, uh, and they want state government to continue it. That's sort of, I mean, that that's how we've gotten into this problem with Medicaid in the first place. Alaska, over over the course of time, has opted into virtually every optional Medicaid service, um, and they've done it because we did it because you know arguably 50% of those costs, um, uh, and in the case of expansion, 90% of those costs, 100% in the first years, 90% in later years, uh, is funded by the federal government. So hey, that's great stuff. It's additional federal money. 
uh, we can expand services. The problem is it comes with the state dollar, the state obligations, and creates the expectations uh, on the part of Alaskans to have these, to have this, 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 this universe of services. And when we get into a fiscal a fiscal crunch like now, or when the federal government cuts back, we still have these ex- Alaskans still have these expe- expectations that we will, that we will provide the services, and you know the states on the state ends up being on the hook to fund them. Right. Well, and we've talked about that in the past that this is part of that issue where you know they've created the need through funding the program to begin with and the and, and all we can do is look to past performance to pr- to predict future results and what we're seeing of course is that the uh, is that the federal government historically leaves us holding the bag i mean we have seen the increase in medicaid funding and things like that happen it's it's not like uh, it's not like it's unknown for them to leave us holding that bag and basically say, "Hey, it's all on you at this point. You guys have got to do something. You know, you guys got to do something different." And we saw our costs in Medicaid, Medicare, and all that kind of stuff just explode over the course of just a handful of years. And so this is this is exactly where we're afraid things are going to go in the future. All of a sudden, we'll be left holding the checkbook and saying. Well, you created it, and now even by Governor Walker's own estimations, fully one-third of Alaskans will be on Medicaid next year. One-third of the state. That's insane. Yeah, and you and people say, well, it's only uh, the state's obligation. I mean, that was the mantra at the time all these services were adopted, right? Well, the state's obligation is only 50% of the cost. But the problem is that's 50%. And the problem also is that as medical costs, healthcare costs rise, escalate, explode, spiral, whatever word you want to use to them, um, Alaska is on the hook for 50% of those costs. And we get into a situation where we're providing all of these services uh, and then we get into a fiscal crunch like we are now, and we really can't get out of we really can't get out of that fifty percent. We can't get out of that spiral because we've opened the door and we've and we've we've told Alaskans, governments told Alaskans these are the services we're going to provide. So it's it's a it's a it, it's sort of a I want to use bait and switch. That may not be the right term, but we get in. Um, uh, thinking that we're going to have substantial federal funding for these things, and and even if we continue to have federal funding at the percentage that the federal government uh, initially uh, 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 promised or initially committed to, even if that continues, when healthcare costs explode, we're fifty percent. I mean, our fifty percent for fifty percent explodes along with it. So if healthcare costs go up ten percent or or fifteen percent or twenty percent. Our our share is going up ten percent, fifteen percent, or twenty percent, and we're in this cycle where we um, uh, where we have these these exploding costs. Other states didn't opt in to uh, the the same extent of, of of Medicaid services that Alaska has opted into. They don't have they have some issues, but they don't have the same issues we're facing in terms of the substantial increase in costs. Uh, coming out of the Medicaid services. So th- that's the danger of federal funding. You get sucked into these programs, and even if the feds you know, keep up with their promise of uh, providing 50% of funding, as, as the, the, the cost of the overall program grows, our 50% grows along with it, and we end up in these situations. Well, and that, of course, is always – I you know, I don't know if bait and switch. I think maybe the sh- what they're doing is they're playing a shell game with the funding mechanism. Oh, no, no, the P's over here. No, no, it's over here. No, it's over here. Who's funding it? Nobody knows, but everybody's got to fund it anyway, so suck it up. That's that's kind of where we're at right now. And, and of course, the state's going to be left holding the bag. And as the state continues to struggle with their revenue stream because of, you know, the, the, the fragility of a resource-based economy, uh, we're it's going to force us closer and closer to have to have a broad-based tax or something else because the appetite for spending is not decreasing proportionate to what our revenue is. Yeah. Well, it's a um, it's a it's a difficult situation and something that uh, you know it, it's something that's showing up in this budget both in terms of the um, the increased cost that we've got and. Uh, the um, uh, uh, 
the expanded services uh, uh, that were that we're stuck with. So what at this point we're looking at this. This is actually a, <clears throat> this is one of the best breakdowns that I've seen in quite a while on where the state spending is going. What do we do with this, Brad? What do we do with this information here as we move forward? Well, Michael, I think I think it's a great guide to where the money is going. I mean, it's it's a great guide to to, sh- to demonstrate how much we're spending on uh, health and social services. It's a great guide to demonstrate how much we're spending on K through 12. Uh, those two programs alone are uh, are a substantial percentage of, of the budget, and if we're going to get the budget down. Uh, those are areas that we're going to have to go into. It's a great guide to, to showing where overall uh, university spending is. Um, so it's, it, it, it targets, uh, it helps identify and target uh, the areas of largest, largest spending. That, that's not new. I mean, we've known that all along, but this is another way, uh, another chart that helps uh, identify, uh, uh, helps identify what, what those areas are. The other thing is, I mean, I'm, again, you're going to have an interesting conversation with Tammy tomorrow, but the other thing is it helps identify where the heck uh, all this money that we've spent this legislature has, has gone to. Uh, and 331 is a, is a big part of that. You can't, right. you can't look at this and say somehow that uh, oh, 331 was a, was, a, was a minor thing or uh, it, it's it's you know not it's, it's a uh, bookkeeping error, the big right? Scheme of things. It's a bookkeeping error. We're just you know we're just fixing a bookkeeping mistake, right? <clears throat> yeah, it's a uh, it's I mean it's a major it's a major piece of legislation, a major cost. So you've identified you've identified these issues. I think three thirty one is a big election issue. Uh, I think it's an issue that 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 those who voted for it are going to have to explain during the course of uh, their campaigns why uh, at a time when we were uh, uh, cutting uh, the PFD, cutting the statutory obligation of the PFT, PFD, we're overpaying, we're accelerating payments, paying more than the statute requires uh, to uh, to certain oil producers. Uh, I think yeah, that's that's a question that I have that I'm going to ask uh, uh, candidates, and I think this uh, uh, guide, this uh, this analysis that's done of where spending go has gone is 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 a a, a useful tool uh, to those questions as well. Brad Keithley's our guest. He's with Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. We're talking about uh, we're talking about the costs of this last legislative session and where we sit when it's all said and done. The bottom line is we are spending more than before, and yet we continue to have a, a huge deficit, a recession. Highest unemployment rate. We could tick off all the boxes, but it's not good moving forward. Uh, let's move on, Brad, to the hypocrisy that we continue to see out of the Senate leadership. And specifically, I'm talking about people like Pete Kelly, Pete Machicki, J- John Coghill, their kind of stance that they continue to take in public uh, on what's happening uh, in the state uh, economy with the state budgets. Well, that, that sort of got encapsulated for me. In a, in a Twitter post uh, that the Alaska Senate majority has made in the last couple of days, there was an article on in, in on KTVA, uh, one of the Anchorage television stations, uh, that sort of summarized where the state got to in terms of fiscal policy. Talked about SB 26 and and what happened to some of the other uh, fiscal proposals that that. Uh, 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 at one time or another, we're in the legislature this last, uh, these last two sessions. And one of them was the discussion about income taxes, the House, uh, progressive income taxes. The House had proposed those uh, as part of its fiscal plan the year before this. Uh, that was sort of sitting on the table as part of the SB 26 conversation. Uh, it didn't go forward, uh, and the article addresses that. In response to the article, uh, the Alaska Senate majority put out this tweet uh, on uh, citing Senator Kelly, uh, and said that to think that Alaska needs a broad-based tax is to be willfully ignorant of the facts. Alaska doesn't need it, and and that's a mantra. <laughs> this, this mantra about taxes is a mantra that the Senate the Senate majority has been on throughout. That we don't need a tax. We don't need a tax. You know, we're here to protect you. We're here to we're here to you know keep costs down. They didn't, but we're we're here to protect you against the tax. The problem with that mantra is the Senate themselves 
were the were the leading advocates of of a head tax that the that the legislature enacted the PFD cuts. Right. PFD cuts are a tax. Hammond said that early on. Hammond said that uh, from the outset when when there were discussions during his era uh, of PFD cuts that it was a head tax. It was it's an analysis that is is the same that's in the ICER analysis uh, that was done in 2016 as we got into this. Uh, fiscal situation, analyzing it and looking at it as a reduction in income to Alaskans, which uh, a, re- a transfer of income from Alaskans to the government, which is the definition of a tax. We've had a tax. It was the uh, it was the Senate that has proposed the tax, and it was and, and according to ICER's analysis and every ec- economist that's looked at it, it has the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy, and is by far. ICER's terms, by far uh, the costliest to Alaska families of all the various options. So the Senate keeps, I mean, what, what is frustrating about this uh, and, and the, hyp- the hypocrisy of it is the Senate keeps trying to divert the debate saying, well, we didn't enact an income tax, uh, and so we saved you from an income tax. Well, at the same time as they're su- trying to say that, they enacted the PFD cuts, which are an even worse form of tax right. uh, on the overall Alaska economy and Alaska families. Right, a more regressive form that affects the middle to lower income far worse on a proportional basis than it does to that upper echelon, uh, the upper middle and uh, the top 20% tier, and of course the top 1% tier, they feel it almost not at all, uh, and yet everybody else is you know, left holding the bag. You know, we're, we're where everybody else is hit feeling it from 8% down upwards of what 30% of their income stream at one point, depending on how large their family is. I mean, this is, this is the hypocrisy that just kills me uh, because that is the mantra. And that's, what's been picked up by quite honestly, by a lot of Republicans and a lot of Republican mouthpieces out there is this idea of, we don't need a tax. Uh, don't tax us for the PFD, blah, 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 blah. Uh, I mean, this is really what they're doing they're trying to appropriate the pfd ahead out you know out ahead of what it was actually obligated for to begin with yeah exactly right governor hammond was governor hammond was clear from the outset that the pfd was what was a manifestation and implementation of the constitutional mandate that that natural resources are for the maximum benefit of the people not the state, but of the people, maximum benefit of the people. And Governor Hammond explained from the beginning that the PFD was there to distribute, in in accordance with that constitutional provision, to distribute the revenues from, a portion of the revenues from the state resources to the people. Um, And and cutting, cutting those revenues, taking them from the people and pulling them back into the state, into state government, uh, by any economic definition, uh, is a tax when you divert revenue out of the hands of individuals or businesses uh, and pull it into the hands of the state. Uh, uh, that is the definition of a tax. So we, we have we have had a tax. It, it's the the, Repu- the, uh, the the Senate Republicans are sort of going down the road as of uh, if you say it often enough and loud enough and aggressively enough. Uh, then, then people will believe you, or or it will become it will become a real thing. Um, and they certainly have repeated this mantra over and over and over and over again. As you said, uh, other Republicans have have picked up on that. Must read Alaska. Uh, will say that from from time to time. Right. But it's not true. It's not true. The PFD cut is a head tax. It is taking revenue otherwise intended under a statute that still exists. A statute that did not get changed in this legislature that provides that 50 percent of the income from uh, uh, from uh, the the permanent fund uh, from the permanent fund will be distributed to Alaskans. A statute that provides that you're taking a portion of that and pulling it back into the state. That is a tax. The Senate led uh, the charge for that tax, and for them to now claim that somehow. Uh, they're not in favor of a broad-based tax, that they protected Alaskans against a broad-based tax. It's just wrong. It's false. It's a false claim. Let's – and I, I know we've done this before, Brad, but I think it is so important for people to understand when we talk about the accounting for the PFD, um, historically the PFD revenue, the revenue from the earnings reserve 
uh, that they would take in uh, to then pay out to the people was simply a pass through. It wasn't even accounted for in like the state budget as far as the numbers of expenditures. It was simply a wash. This much came in, that much went out. It was a wash when it was all said and done. But the governor and the administration decided as a political tool to then stop that and take that so that the money that came in, they then counted as revenue. And so, therefore, the PFD itself became another expenditure line. So when they cut the PFD, they could say, we cut the budget because we cut expenditures, even though historically, up until that point, it had never been done. Am I right? I mean, am I, am I, am I describing this correctly? No, you're describing it exactly correctly. For for several years, right at the beginning of the PFD, the the the, the permanent fund distribution doesn't show up as a line item on any of the state's budgets. Uh, the statute itself says the statute itself doesn't bring it through the budget. The statute says that the permanent fund corporation shall distribute to the permanent fund uh, uh, dividend division of the Department of Revenue. 50% of the earnings that the that the permanent fund corporation has experienced uh, during the previous year uh, uh, off of the permanent fund shall shall distribute to the permanent fund dividend so d- division so it didn't really even come in as, as uh, into the budget at all it was just treated as that as that separate flow and then it it, it started showing up in the budget and it was treated in various years either as other state funds uh, which are generally treated as off the book funds or treated as designated for for specific purposes they're coming from various specific sources they're going to very specific uses sort of like federal funds i mean it's just sort of treated as a flow through or they were treated as designated general funds because there's a statute that said you shall do this and and the definition of a designated fund is there's a designation of how that fund shall be treated how those revenues shall be treated and a statute is normally the is normally the the mechanism through which you have that designation. So, the the permanent the PFDs were then treated as designated general funds. Didn't come into the unrestricted general funds, which is generally viewed as money that over which the legislature has uh, has control. And then a couple of years ago, when we got into this fiscal situation and people started talking about uh, about cutting the PFD, GCI, GCI started its Alaska Future campaign to convince legislators uh, to cut the PFD. All of a sudden, you found from an accounting standpoint and from a budgeting standpoint, the permanent fund distribution, the permanent fund dividend distribution, which previously had been treated either off the books as other state funds or as designated general funds, all of a sudden got shifted over to the unrestricted general funds. And and they started being treated as as just just another source of revenue the state that the legislature and the governor could play with, just like oil production taxes uh, or just like uh, uh, various other, about $500 million in other uh, uh, ta- various taxes and fees uh, that the state that the state takes in. All of which are treated as unrestricted general funds, and the budget and the governor and the legislature just budget them out. So they changed. I mean, you, they changed the wording. It's sort of like what the Senate's trying to do, right? You you change the substance by change by changing the wording, right? And they changed it from other and from DGF over to UGF, and then all of a sudden, well, it's state funds. Right, right. It's now not. It's, yeah, now not it's Alaskans public. funds. It's state funds. Again, this reminds. And now me. we can do with it whatever we want. And if we give any to Alaskans, they ought to be thankful for it. <laughs> uh, but otherwise, uh, it's something that that we can treat just like general state funds and and put to uh, to to general state fund spending. Um, and it's and, and it's you know, it, it's one of those examples of if you repeat it often enough, and if you can get it in the right column. Uh, then, then all of a sudden, magically, it becomes that. And and what is what is in any other uh, environment, in any other uh, with any other fund that we have, what is certainly at least a designated general fund, designated by statute for a specific purpose, not to be not to be you know crossed over and used for other things. What is at least that? All of a sudden, that became an unrestricted general fund. Right. The Senate's trying to do the same thing. The Senate's saying, oh, it's not a tax. <laughs> it's it's something else. It's you know we're just using state funds uh, because look it's in the UGF column. We're just using state funds, and, that's and so we're not diverting it from individuals. It's state state money all along. Yeah, we gave it to individuals for a few years, but 
you know, we, we can no longer afford to do that. State funds down, so we're going to spend it. But it's not really a tax, folks. Don't think of it as a tax. We're going to protect right. you against real taxes. It's right. not really a tax. But, that's but when you, again, when you go back and look at the economic definition of tax, which is diverting revenue that's otherwise uh, uh, intended for individuals um, uh, to government, that is the definition of a tax. And if you look at the state statute, which this legislature didn't change, you look at the state statute, it says 50% of the permanent fund earnings will go to uh, to permanent fund dividends. And that continues to feed back into that whole argument again that don't tax us to pay the PFD because, again, they're now lumping that money, which originally came from a whole different area, a whole different source, wasn't even desi- – wasn't even uh, – uh, was designated, all those kind of things. Now they can say, oh, well, now it's a tax. Uh, you know, or Now we would have to tax you to pay it out because this money is now going to other things when, in essence, what they've done is they have misdirected the funds from the very beginning at this point. That's how they're going to now justify that argument on that regard. Um, we're looking for Brad again. It looks like Brad couldn't hear me. Brad, can you hear me now? You still with us? Well, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I, it, here's the thing, Brad. Uh, there was a little bit there where I could tell that you couldn't hear me, even though I was talking to you and trying to interject. And you finished your thought, and my comment back to you was the following. My comment was, this is just another example of how they are now justifying that argument of, don't tax me, bro, to pay the PFD, because they have taken those funds and they've designated those funds now uh, to do other things instead of pay the dividend. And so they're 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 creating their own mess by justifying these things and then creating their own argument of let's uh, go ahead and and not tax ourselves to pay the PFD. Yeah, exactly. I mean it's, they're changing the wording uh and the le- and the the media to some extent is going along with it. Uh, uh to some extent blindly, to some extent if you look at Must Read Alaska for their own political purposes, it right. helps support the Republicans. And it's uh, changing the wording is they're, they're trying to change the substance. But the substance is this. The substance is the statute says 50% of the earnings will go to the permanent fund dividend. And they are taking, they're not delivering that 50%. They're diverting a portion of it to government. So when you divert a portion of a revenue stream that goes to an individual to government, that is the classic economic definition of a tax. Uh, Harold asks, is there a possibility that the POMV would result in a higher PFD than the 50-50 split? Yes, uh, under certain circumstances. We ran an analysis two months ago, three months ago, four months ago, something like that. You can find it on our blog uh, that showed that under certain circumstances, yes, the POMV could produce a higher revenue stream uh, to uh, uh, to the dividend. It wouldn't. It wouldn't persist over time. It's sort of a timing issue. Sometimes the POMV would produce a higher one. Sometimes it would produce a lower one. Actually, over time, there's not that much difference uh, between a POMV and a uh, and and the current the current statutory approach. If you take inflation proofing out of both the government side and out of the PFD side, uh, as you should. But yes, there there are circumstances under which a POMV. Uh, uh, could produce a higher uh, PFD. <clears throat> okay, so now we've gone down into it. And we see how they've done it, how they're framing the argument, the hypocrisy of what's going on, what they're saying. And I think that leads us back to the discussion. Brad, I don't know if you caught the piece yesterday. Uh, it was in Must Read, which really kind of surprised me. And it was a piece from Todd Smolden on what happened with SB26. And, uh, and it kind of talked about it. He actually even quotes diapering the devil and other things in this Hammond's piece. And I think that ties nicely into kind of your last thought here on getting the words straight from the horse's mouth, so to speak. Uh, let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, the latest thing that we're seeing right now uh, on the interwebs from Senator Mike Dunleavy. Well, there's a new ad out that at the end tells you it's from Dunleavy, but but the first 80 percent of it could be from Dunleavy or Begich or anybody else who believes uh, in the PFD. And basically, it's Jay Hammond himself. On, right. on videotape well, talking about the PF well, talking about the PFD. And hold on one second, Brad. I will go ahead and we will show the folks exactly what uh, we're talking about. Why don't here. you tell us, Governor Hammond, what you think the role of the permanent fund should be in our economy? I have concluded that there is never a point at which we should cap the dividend. Alaska is an owner state. 
Now I prefer the term Alaskans are an owner people because when you say an owner state, it suggests the state government owns those resources. But our constitution says everybody owns them. To me, it would be asinine, frankly, to reduce dividends if you're putting the whole burden on Alaskans and only Alaskans. <laughs> this communication was paid for by Dunleavy for Alaska. Top contributor. That was per, that was pretty DC much it. I mean, that was that was straight from the horse's mouth. You couldn't get much better than that right there. And I I think that is an ad. If I were a candidate that favored the PFD, I'd run that. I'd run that clip over and over and over and over. And what I think is really good for the state is to have that education, have that history from Hammond. Uh, about what he intended with the PFD, why the PFD is justified, and why, as he puts it in that last phrase, it's asinine to think about cutting the PFD because you're affecting Alaskans only. Um, I think it's great to have that uh, to have that out there playing on the on the certainly on video uh, and on uh, and on radio waves also because that's we need to educate Alaskans. We need to take Alaska if we're going to have this debate about whether we have a PFD and whether we have a, and what kind of PFD we have, we're going to have this debate. We need to go back to, we need to go back to Hammond because it's, it's, it's his, it's his original, he and his advisors, their original concept and his explanation of what the PFD was intended for, I think trumps everybody else's. It's like when you, it's like when you want to study the U S constitution, right? And you want to understand what a particular provision is, uh, in the U.S. Constitution, well, you go back to the founding fathers, and you go right. back to things like the Federalist Papers that that outline what was intended, what what was what the contemporary intent was uh, at the time that uh, at the time that the that the U.S. Constitution was put together. Well, this is the same thing with the PFD. If we want to truly understand why the PFD is there, and we want to truly understand what the foundation of its for, of it is, and the economic effect, and and somebody who thought and and get that from somebody who thought about it deeply. Uh, then, then we need to hear Hammond's words on it. I've tried to do that through, you know, quoting from Diapering the Devil uh, and from uh, from the money chapter of of Hammond's book, Tales of an Alaska Bushrat Governor. Uh, others have tried it in other ways, but this videotape, I think that they've that they've gotten into the into the ad, I think it's just an outstanding way of doing it, and I hope hope it plays a lot. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that it definitely hits all the marks, all the bells and whistles, and kind of kind of short circuits a lot of the things that you're hearing legislators say today. I mean, he, you know, I I, I hate to say the guy was prescient, but at some point you got to say, man, he was seeing exact. I guess nothing ever changes is is really the lesson here. There's nothing new under the sun. The politicians of today are doing exactly what a lot of the politicians were doing back in Hammond's day, which was, I mean, they took that first $900 million payment and they just squandered it. I mean, they just blew it. Uh, they were first supposed to put 50% of the next payment into the PFD, and they whittled that down to 25%. That was the seed money for the permanent fund corpus. And and so, I mean, maybe nothing ever changes. Maybe the more they more they change, the more they stay the same when it's all said and done. Uh, but this is seems to be a common problem with politicians, especially in the state of Alaska. Well, you you go through and read Diapering the Devil, and you find Hammond's discussion of debates that go on at various times in Alaska's history. He discuss, he describes a debate he has with Pete Cott, who was at one time the the, the Speaker of the House, um, uh, and Cott saying, "Oh, the PFD is just you know, it's it's we're, we shouldn't be wasting it on individuals. We should be using it for government. We should be avoiding uh, income taxes or sales taxes." And, it's, and and Cott saying exactly the same thing Pete Kelly's saying. I mean, Hammond Hammond went through these battles uh, in, first in the creation of the PFD, then at various times. Uh, to to keep the PFD going, and and to hear his words on it, I think is just terrific. And 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 the other thing it does, Michael. I mean, I remember this debate that Pete Kelly had with with Bill Willikowski, uh in in a Senate hearing committee about Willikowski's, uh bill to to create a constitutional provision uh, protecting the PFD. And Kelly went on and on and on about how he was here at the time and he knows what the PFD is for. And Willikowski couldn't know what it was for, and 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 Pete goes off and gives his opinion about what it's for. Well. Frankly, Pete's wrong. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you, uh, the, the foundation of the PFD was Hammond, 
Uh, it wasn't Pete Kelly's, and Hammond is the best to describe it. And this videotape, uh, I think it's just a, it's just an excellent way to do it. I, my comment when I saw it uh, and posted it up is, uh, we may wear this out. We may wear this video out uh, during the campaign, playing it over and over and over and over again. Uh, it's it's that good, and I think it's just a, I think it's just a terrific way. And and it's not, again, it's not partisan in the sense of you know. It's not that Mike Dunleavy owns it. Um, Dunleavy's campaign happens to be the one uh, that put it out, but it could easily be uh, Begich's, uh, uh, a Begich ad, or it could easily be uh, another person's ad who uh, who's supporting the PFD. So sure. could be a I, it's a nonpartisan ad, right? yeah. discussion. Yeah, it could be a Wilikowski ad, could be whoever, anybody that supports the original formulation and the and the and the original payout and the idea and promise behind the PFD. This could be their ad. I mean, they could take this ad and they all should have just chipped in and made it and then throw their banners on the end, paid for by, paid for by, paid for by. You want to create a coalition of like-minded individuals who have one purpose, and that is protecting the Alaskan people. Wouldn't that be something at some point? Yeah. And and Hammond and Hammond explains, I mean, just to go back to the conversation we were just having before about how the how the Alaska Senate majority and how others have tried to distort this. By changing the language, you go back to the original language. Hammond says it is the fulfillment of a promise in the Constitution that the state's resources will be used for the maximum benefit of the people, not the government, the maximum benefit of the people, and that, and that, the, and that the, the PFD is, is the best way in which uh, government has been fulfilling uh, that obligation, that promise. Uh, under the Constitution, so you, I mean, you 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 get back to the basics. You 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 sort of strip away these later arguments about oh, it's government money because look, it all of a sudden it showed up under the UGF bracket. Right. Um, you, you get back to the basics. What was it intended for? What does it? What what what's its purpose? What's its goal? Um, uh, and you and you sort of you, you do an education process that I think this state badly needs. Brad Keithley is our guest. Alaska's for a Sustainable Budget is his organization. You can find him on Facebook. Uh, we've got links up in the uh, comment on Facebook right now for both the Dunleavy ad and also the spreadsheet from Steve St. Clair. If you want to take a look at it, you can see them in the comment section there that I posted on the right-hand side of the page. Brad, as we wrap up here, so we had, you know, our top three things, you know, was, of course, the cost of the session and HB 331. We had the hypocrisy of the Senate leadership in Pete Kelly's tweet. We have this final piece here, the Hammond, uh, the Hammond, the words straight from Hammond's mouth. And uh, wh what do we do with all this as citizens? What do we do with all this as people who are sick and tired of being treated uh, the way that we're being treated right now by the by the majorities in both chambers? What do we do? How do we move forward? Give us some thoughts. Well, I think I think sharing the Hammond video. I mean, if there's a way of stripping out the Dunleavy ad at the end, if that if that offends people or makes them turn off uh, to listening to it, sharing the Hammond video, uh, I think, would be is an excellent way uh, that people can help their friends and neighbors understand uh, what the purpose of the PFD was. And what the uh, what the goal of the PFD was, and why why it's so important to continue to to keep the PFD uh, at the fifty fifty split that that Hammond uh, originally intended. What that means to Alaska families, what that means to uh, to Alaska individuals, uh, to the overall Alaska economy. Uh, I think I think sharing that's one thing. The other thing is I would take the Steve St. Clair uh, or the 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 analysis that Steve posted that we're sharing here, resharing here. Uh, and I, if I were uh, individuals, I'd be looking through that and trying to understand where all the spending goes, trying to understand the budget, trying to understand what happened with these bills that the legislature just passed, the impact of those, understanding where the dollars are coming from and understand where the dollars are going to so that I'm better educated as an individual, better educated when the campaign starts, when somebody says, well, we need to cut HSS or we need to cut K through 12 or we need to increase funding someplace else. Whatever they're saying, you have a background and an understanding of how all those pieces fit together. Right. Well, we've got to educate ourselves. And more than anything else, we have to get out there and get involved, I think. Uh, I mean, again, our charter of changes that we've talked about, changing the players, the venue, the rules, those things have got to happen. Otherwise, we're always going to get what we always got. 
right? That's that's all we're going to do is get more of the same. Right, and 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 getting involved can be as simple as sharing that video. It can yeah. be as simple as letting letting people hear Hammond for themselves. Absolutely, I, I couldn't agree more. That is powerful stuff, uh, and uh, it looks really good. Uh, Brad, folks, will find you out on Facebook. We'll put the link back up in the uh, back up in the uh, comment section as well. Final thoughts? I'll let you go. Tell me your final thoughts here before we we kick you out the door. <laughs> Well, my final thought is I'm looking forward to your conversation with Tammy tomorrow. I, <laughs> I, 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 I honestly don't know how you defend 331. I mean, she may say it's a, it was, you know, we owe these monies anyway. We didn't. We didn't owe them uh, all this year. Uh, the statute provided a, a payment schedule that ran several years. She, will, she may say it benefits Alaskans. It doesn't. You can look at the, the analysis, the exchange that Ed King and I had about it. You, there was an assumption that it would benefit if we save the money, but there's no indication that we're going to save the money uh, that uh, that we're 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 generating by this addition by this borrowing. We're just going to spend it on other things. We've already started to do that, so it'll be interesting to me, and I and I look forward to hearing the conversation about about how she tries to defend it. Well, like I said, I, I would love to have you and Tammy on just <clears throat> as a discussion uh, afterwards. Maybe I'll uh, maybe I'll see if I could twist her arm into coming back on, or we can. Because uh, I mean, I, I again, you're two of my favorite people, and so to sit down and talk about these things, uh, what we disagree on, I think a lot of times is more enlightening than what we agree on. And I'd love to uh, I'd love to hear this conversation uh, go back and forth. So maybe I'll try and maybe I'll try and make that happen uh, here in the uh, in the near future. Brad Keithley. Thank you so much, my friend, for being part of the program today. We appreciate you coming on the program. Michael, thank you as always. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.